And um, he maintained his ability to, to read and write in Arabic. And um, he was a scholar, he was an emir, and he was actually the leader of a great army. And this was recognized immediately by his slave masters. And so they made him um, the leader uh, of the, the slaves. He was actually the one who kept the slaves in line. And despite what was happening to him, he always wanted to be freed from slavery to return to his own. It is reported that um, Abdurrahman uh, saw a person, a white American uh, doctor, a person who had been in West Africa, who had actually uh, uh, suffered and gotten very sick and was indebted to Abdurrahman's family. And so when he saw this man, he called the man and he reminded him that his family had taken in the man for three months in West Africa and he asked the man to get him out of slavery. So this man then began to raise funds in order to free Abdurrahman from slavery. Eventually he was able to get out and he started to tour the country. During this time, he was asked to write the Lord's Prayer. So now he's asked to write something in Arabic. They, they, they like his Arabic writing. So they say to him, and maybe this is a type of joke, or, or, or you know, they're playing with him, and they say, uh, can you write the Lord's Prayer in Arabic? So Abdurrahman writes the Lord's Prayer. And this is the actual text. And it says the Lord's Prayer, and he writes, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmanir Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. And he writes the Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran. But they can't read Arabic, so they don't know um, that it's actually the, the Fatiha that he's read. And, and this is a very interesting document um, because it shows what happens in the slavery period. Uh, and it shows uh, um, you know, the, the, the fact that Muslims respected their faith even though they were forced to appear as though they had accepted uh, Christianity. So Abdurrahman toured the country and he raised funds uh, to get his wife out of slavery, which he did. And then he was trying to raise funds for his children, but he was not able to do this. Because of a political change in the atmosphere in America, he ended up going back to his country. Uh, fate had it, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came in, and six months after he returned um, to his home in West Africa, he, uh, he got cholera and he died. His, some of his children did, however, return to West Africa. They were freed from slavery and they were eventually reunited um, with his mother uh, in West Africa. Another interesting uh, personality is Yaro Mahmud. Yaro Mahmud... Um, has one of the most um, well-known faces from amongst the slaves. He was born in the 1700s and he died at the age of 128. He was freed from slavery after 70 years. Now just imagine 70 years in slavery. But when you look at his face, he's a man over 100 years old, uh, he still looks like he's young. And so Yaro Mahmud is a very interesting personality, uh, a well-known person, highly respected. And um, he is a person who is respected by African Americans uh, up until today. Another important personality within the scholars of slavery is Umar ibn Sayyid. And Umar ibn Sayyid um, is known because of his prolific ability to write. And he uh, is reported to have written 14 manuscripts. He wrote his own autobiography in the Arabic language. Um, unfortunately, he died in a state of slavery. And the writings of uh, uh, Omar ibn Sayyid are being studied in America up until today. What we find within these documents is a powerful use of the Arabic language. And we find um, a man expressing himself, writing about his life, giving details through the Arabic. So he was highly proficient, and, and he was able to express deep thoughts within the Arabic language. 
And his uh, documents or some of his documents are actually available in America today. Um, uh, at last uh, word, they were, they were in the city of Detroit. Um, they were purchased by uh, African American uh, Muslims and they are on display um, in institutes. And um, this is part of the rich heritage uh, of uh, uh, Africans in America and especially Muslims uh, who had come to this part of the world. What is crucial again for us to remember that these are people living in bondage, but they are ulama, they are scholars, and they are writing the texts, they are maintaining their dignity, they are maintaining their honor, and suffering at the same time. And this is part of the uh, message or part of the duty and responsibility of the prophets, and that was that even though they were suffering, uh, they still maintained their dignity. So the scholars in slavery in America had a great uh, heritage, and they become important people uh, for our understanding of what happened in this region. After this, we find also that there are other uh, individuals who are well known. From amongst them were two slaves who were uh, enslaved in Georgia on the Sapelo Islands, Bilali Muhammad and Saleh Bilali were two Imams known of course in Mende language as Al-Mamis and this is how they were uh, uh, referred to and this uh, picture is from the, the documents, the actual document of Bilali Muhammad uh, himself that was written in uh, Georgia on the Sapelo Islands. And again, it's interesting to see the usage of the word al-mamis. We saw this appear in Central America, when the people within uh, Panama and Honduras, the areas where African people were living in Central America, would actually use the term al-mamis, and jaras, and guabas, and kaba. They were using West African mandate terminologies. Again, the word al-mamis comes from al-imamu, which comes from Al-Imam. So both Bilali Muhammad and Saleh Bilali were Imams and leaders of their people and their relatives are still living within these islands in Georgia today. What they are known for, especially in American history, is that they were literally given um, the, the military responsibility to protect the islands. So their relationship with their slave masters and the authorities was different than uh, other slaves that we find coming out of American history. Because they were literally given weapons, and, and we find that when this island was under attack, that they actually protected the islands, and um, they were respected by their people, and given all of the, the, the dignity and all of the rights of an imam within an Islamic territory. Bilali Muhammad uh, was known as a person who was strict in his prayers. He would constantly make his salat and he carried a rug uh, along with him and even when they were working he would stop and he would make his prayers. He constantly wore a fez uh, on his head and um, he would make his dua to the creator of the heavens and the earth and when he eventually passed away um, they put his fez and his rug uh, down into his uh, grave area. And um, he is known in the Sapelo region up until now. What is interesting that comes out in some of the history textbooks is that coming out of Georgia, the word Bilali becomes known as Bela. And then through language and time, it becomes known as Bailey. So anybody who comes from the Sapelo Islands of Georgia or in Georgia itself who has the name Bailey is actually considered to be a descendant either of Bilali Muhammad or Saleh Bilali. And this is an interesting point for us because um, when the historians look into the history they find that there was no slave master named Bailey. It was the practice of many of the slave masters to name uh, their slaves after their family name. But there was no Bailey within the Georgia area. So anybody who was named uh, Bailey was more than likely a descendant of Muslims. Why this is important is because one of the great abolitionists 
a person well known in American history named Frederick Douglass. He was a direct descendant of the Baileys. So this great abolition, abolitionist, this great freedom fighter who was known in American history was more than likely coming out of an Islamic background. It's also interesting to note that other names amongst the slaves were, were, were being uh, distorted and mispronounced and changed into English names. Abu Bakr was changed into Bukha. And we find other names uh, which are being changed. And so therefore, um, one, another great personality uh, in the South, whose name was Booker T. Washington, um, may possibly also have come from an Islamic background. So if you look at African American history and American history, if you say that Booker T. Washington, who was a great leader of a, a, a college, a great educator, Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass came from Muslim backgrounds, then we would literally be changing the nature of American history. Again, these are gems of wisdom. This is part of the untold story of world history. This is part of a legacy that needs to be known by the people of the world. Islam has always been the religion of education, the religion of progress, the religion of resistance to evil. And again we see in America another part of this saga. Muslims were able to develop themselves. They were able to maintain Arabic writing. They were able to keep the traditions uh, in a state of slavery for a long period of time. Unfortunately, because of um, the pain of slavery, it was eventually for the most part lost, but now it is coming back to the surface with hundreds and thousands of African Americans coming into Islam and roots, the, the, the search for roots is recognized to be, to a great extent, a search for Islam. So I leave you with these thoughts and I pray that you will continue to live in peace and that Muslims and the whole world will find peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.